And we are continuing our series, Faith That Works By Love. We said we were going to pick up from last Wednesday night. And before I, I get into the scripture that we're going to, uh, th that is the basis of our study, I, I, I feel like the writer of the book of Jude, who talked about being compelled to include a subject in his letter, um, although it was, wasn't necessarily his first thought, I, I, I kind of get us, I understand that sense of urgency uh, that the writer felt. Uh, because tonight, while I, uh, we, have, we have our overarching message of love, um, my immediate concern uh, for the Bible study tonight is that um, um, it, it's what I, I, I'll call being uh, mean-spirited. Uh, I, I, I don't know about you, but I've never, I haven't seen as much as I have uh, the animosity and uh, the division that has spilled over into the church uh, as I've seen in our country in the last few years. I mean, I have seen people standing for something that was good. They were standing. The message was good. The message was right. It was biblical. But they had, they were mean-spirited. I mean, and, and the first thought that comes to my mind is, now, how do you think that's going to work for you? If our message it, it, that this message that we have in these earthen vessels, in these jars of clay, this gospel, this powerful message that's able to change lives, that's able to open up blinded eyes, that's able to turn people uh, from hatred to love, that's able to, to send uh, broken men back to their families and to send uh, broken sons and daughters back to their mothers and fathers. This gospel that's so powerful and we believe that, that's so valuable to us. If it's that valuable, why would we behave in a way that would prevent us from sharing it? How, if, if you are a, acrid and, and, and you, you ever, see, you ever uh, bit into a lemon, what does your face do, right? And, and, and I see people with this glorious gospel coming off their lips, with this, this sweet-smelling savor of the love of Christ coming out of their mouth. But they look like this. And I don't know about your brain, but my brain is not able to process that. I try to reconcile it. And I just can't do it. I just cannot reconcile the love of God with somebody so angry and they're spewing out venom. They're, they, I mean, and listen, what you're saying could be true, but who's going to receive it? Who's going who's to accept that? And so tonight I want to talk about that. Can I talk about it? I, I, and, and, and listen, my measuring, my measuring, my, my observation is purely anecdotal. I don't have any data. I don't have a data sheet. I haven't done any empirical studies. All I know is I see the hate. I see the hate. I felt the hate. And I'm not trying to teach a, a social gospel. What I'm trying to tell you is that the Word of God is so powerful that it changes people's lives. And if it changes your life, it can change your attitude. We're talking about turning murderers around. We're talking about turning people around whose lives were turned in a direction that was completely dark, and God took that life and turned it to the light. He's able to do that. Why can't he change your attitude? Don't tell 
me he can't change your attitude. And, and I'm more concerned about your attitude because your attitude is critical to your testimony. I maintain that while we are to stand for truth, the spirit with which we engage the world, and especially opposing brothers and sisters, is critical to our testimony. The Bible says that Jesus says to his disciples, they'll, they'll know that ye are my disciples by your love for one another. It's easy to love people way over there because you don't have to deal with them, right? But he's told his disciples, because of your love for one another. Don't you see? This is prophetic. Everybody say prophetic. Everybody say it's prophetic. It's prophetic. Listen, it's prophetic. He said, they'll know that you are my disciples for your love for one another. And yet, what we have seen happen in the church is division, is divisiveness. It is the separation of brothers and sisters. It would be no much no, no more separation of brothers and sisters if someone came into your home and split your home. We are allowing the, 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 uh, the ethos of the world. The word ethos simply means the culture, the, the way that the world does things. We are allowing the ethos of the world to come in and, 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 and contaminate the culture of the church. We're allowing that, you and I, and God has told us in the book of Jude to, to be set in defense. But when he says be set in defense, uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna look at this thing. He, he, he's not talking about you um, being angry and ugly. That's not what God is telling you to do. I, every, every boxing uh, uh, instru in, in, in any coach uh, uh, where there's some pugilism, where there's fighting going on, where there's always they, they, I always hear them instruct the fight don't get mad it'll, it'll, it'll cloud your judgment, don't get angry if you're, if you're, if you're going to be a good athlete don't get angry you get emotional and you, and you, and you forget the principles you forget what's fundamental. You forget what the objective is. See, you get angry and you forget the objective is to share the testimony of Jesus Christ. The, 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 the objective is to show the love of God, to share and show, share and show, share and show, share and show. And if you have this venom all down in you, you cannot share and you definitely are not going to show the love of God. I don't care how, uh, how many Christian words you use and how theologically sound your doctrine might be. I've heard some people that, 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 I mean, really great teachers, and then they'll say something really dumb. I heard a pastor, and he was talking about, he was angry, and he was teaching about uh, the, the, the Pentecostal experience and, and, and this pastor actually I heard it with my own ears he said and they can go to hell with their tongues and I thought man even if you don't agree you, you really want us you want and I'm Pentecostal I don't make no, no bones about that but, but I'm thinking to myself you really want us to go to hell pastor I like the way my wife does that to me. Whenever she thinks that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm out of character, she'll say, Pastor Billy. <laughs> That's just like saying my full name. Okay, Pastor Billy. But so what we want to closely examine, this scripture, that tells us to do three things. And that's what we're going to be concerned about tonight and we'll be concerned about tomorrow. And uh, these three things are necessary 
to the advancement of the gospel and thereby the kingdom of God. That's how we advance the kingdom of life, by sharing the word of God. And with these instructions, and this is the, this is the, 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 the focal point, this is the operative part of the scripture that I want you to really hone in on. With these three, the, as important as these instructions are, there is a caveat with these instructions. In other words, we got the instructions, but there's this one thing that's so important and so essential that those three things don't work without this. Okay? This is the caveat. This is, in other words, this has to be in place in order for these things to happen. Uh, these three things things to be effective rather and this is the caveat you have to do them in love that's the caveat you have to do them in love so this evening we'll concern ourselves with what becomes things absent love and we'll see it will it, it's my desire that you see the value and power of love by observing the futility of our efforts without it. I want you to see the value and the power of love by observing the futility or, uh, or, or uh, the, the weakness, the ineffectual uh, uh, or ineffectiveness of, 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 of these things without love without love you ever you ever uh I, I love this commercial where this uh this guy's he's he's all smiling and and he's doing everything but rubbing his hands together because he's going to the refrigerator and he's gonna make himself a sandwich and he's, he gets out the 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 bread he he gets out the cheese he gets out uh his protein, I don't know if it's turkey or, or ham or whatever it is, but he gets that out, and then he gets out the mustard, and, he, and he's almost salivating. And then he looks, and you see him kind of, and he takes everything back and just puts it back in the refrigerator, and just puts the bread back, puts the mustard back, because there's no miracle whip. <laughs> Love is a miracle whip of the ethos of our church, of the body of Christ. Love. Man, you might as well just, there's no, there's no love putting everything back. I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want it. Because it just won't work without love. Man, if, 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 can you imagine what the impact that we could have in, even in our local church, if we really loved each other? Just really. I'm not saying that we don't. I'm saying that there is always room for improvement. And I'm saying that we need to make a not me looking in your life or you looking in my life it takes me looking in my life and you looking in your life and doing so honestly and doing so through the lens of the scriptures because you could think you're okay but you're not okay if God says you're not okay if God says you're not okay, you're not okay. If the Bible says that you're not okay, you're not okay. So in 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, the Bible says this. Be on your guard. And then we see there's a semicolon there. So be on your guard. How, how do I do that? There's getting ready to follow something. Something's following that, a list of things. So 
be on your guard. Everybody say, be on your guard. Say it again. So be on your guard. Don't just say it out in the atmosphere. Say it to somebody. Tell them, tell them, be on your guard. Yeah. I, 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 I want you to be able to take this away from here and live this thing. Else, what am I doing? I might as well go sit down somewhere. Be on your guard. So, how do I do that? First, stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. However, however, do everything in love. Do everything in love. And this is, this, this is not new. We're told to do uh, everything that we do, we should do it as unto the Lord. And you can't do anything as unto the Lord if it's not out of love. It says, do everything in love. So tonight, we're asking ourselves, what happens when you stand firm, but do so without love? What happens when you stand firm? Because the Bible says stand firm, right? It says stand firm. But it says do it in love. What happens if you do it without love? What does the word firm mean? It, it, the word firm means to be adamant. To be adamant. To not be, uh, for, to be, not be pliable, easily pliable. Uh, not, to be firm means to be like a rock. To be unmovable. That's not a bad thing in and of itself, right? I mean, when we have, we have Christian values, right? that we want to stand firm in. We don't, as, as believers, uh, let's, let's take some, a practical uh, thing. We, as believers, we believe that abortion is wrong. Am I right about that? Amen. Say amen. amen. We, as believers, believe that abortion is wrong, that it is murder, that it is killing innocent life. We believe that. And we should stand firm. We should be unshakable. We should, we, 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 we should, we, we should not uh, uh, shrink back when we uh, find ourselves uh, facing opposition because of that value that we have. We should stand firm. We should say to ourselves, come what may. Do what you got to do, but I'm going to say what the Bible says. All life, all life, born, unborn, all life is precious to the Lord. Taking a stand is not the problem. The problem is the spirit with which we engage opposition. We don't shoot people because they don't believe what we believe. We don't take signs and beat them across the head. That's not going to make them believe. We don't call them names. We don't tell them that God hates them. That's not true, because before you came to him, you were one of them. Because if you've offended the word of God in any part, the Bible says you've offended the whole Bible. If you've offended the Bible in any part, and none of us in here, none of us is without sin. I don't care. Go get your old grandma who makes the best cookies in the world. She's a sinner. She's a sinner. 
and I love her. I love, I told you about my grandma, how precious she was to me. But she was human. She was scarred. She was, she has been tainted like every person born of woman. She's been tainted by sin. So none of us, none of us can become the righteousness of God without Jesus Christ. So why would we tell, and, and, and our desire is for them to, to be saved. Because the, that's what Jesus wants. Jesus was walking with some, some disciples, some, some friends of his. And, and, and as they were walking, there were some opposing forces. There were some people from another denomination. They called them Pharisees. And they were uh, not saying nice things and had told some untruths. And so one of the disciples piped up and said to Jesus, you want me to call fire out of heaven and get them? And Jesus says to this friend, he says, look, and I'm paraphrasing, but he must say, man, look, I know, I know, I know you got my back. I know you got my back. I know you, I know that, that you're loyal to me. But you don't understand. I didn't come to destroy people. I came to save them. If you want the King James Version, he said, the Son of Man came to save life, not to destroy it. Yeah, Jesus loves your worst enemy. Wow. Have you ever sat in the room with somebody and you just, they just made your hairs on your arm go the opposite direction, you know, and just, you know, and, and it was everything that you could do to keep your cool. Jesus loves that individual. He not only loves them, but he died for them. Yeah, he did. I think about people that have done some horrendous things. I, I, have, I have a proclivity uh, toward the underdog. I, I'm, I'm, I'm always looking to, to defend. I don't know what it is about me, but I'm always looking to defend somebody. <laughs> I can't even defend myself. But I'm always looking to, to stand up for somebody who can't stand for themselves. It, it always breaks my heart to see people uh, take advantage of vo people who are vulnerable. Don't do that around me. That, if you do that, you're going to see some righteous indignation. We're going to have some heated fellowship. <laughs> but I have, I've, I've found that even the worst person that behaves that way toward someone that, that I would want to defend, God loves that, that guy. God loves that lady. God loves your boss who, who, who may be trying to take advantage of you. God loves them. They may be the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the biggest jerk that you know. But you should be praying for them. And the Bible says, and by doing so, you heap coals of fire on their head. Now, that does not mean, oh, you get to shovel some hell on them. I know that's what you want. Because God, you ain't moving fast enough, right? But that's not what that means. What it means is that you bring conviction to them. You see, the Bible says soft answers turn away wrath. When you, when you, how do you, how do you, how do you deal with it? That just, that's why people get so angry when, when you do what God says. When you're, when you behave the way Jesus does, man, it just irks people. Because they can't. They, 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 they can't be mean to you. 
The Bible says that when a man, when a person's ways please God, even their enemies want to be at peace with them. It's hard. It's hard to, 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 I like the way Martin Luther King said, he said, you, you can't dispel hate with hate. Only love can do that. Only love can do that. And I don't care how, I, I don't care how, how many rounds that love and hate fight. I don't care if, 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 if love answers the bell, dragging one foot, one eye, and, and only able to swing one arm, love is going to win every time. It's going to win every time. Every time. Every time. And, and, and we should have that heart as believers, as the disciples of Christ. Listen, you might be able, you might be faster than me and quicker than me, but you ain't going to outlove me. You're not going to outlove me. You, could, you, you might be able to whoop me. I, I was telling someone, you know, here I am again trying to be, defend people. And I was thinking, you know, if I ever, uh, I, as believers, one of, uh, in our ethos, we, 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 you know, there are things that we, we believe that are not uh, biblical. And, and I know nowadays preachers don't like to call sin out, you know, but I'm not afraid <laughs> Man, uh, if, if you don't let me talk to you, I'll go talk to somebody else. <laughs> but there are things that, that, that are just wrong, right? There, there are things that are, that are, that are just, just wrong in, in Scripture. And, and when you take a stand, that when you take a stand for what's right, you must and this is what mature Christians do. How many, how many of you are mature? <laughs> Just three of us? Okay. But when you're mature, when you're a mature Christian, when you take a stand, you know what the first thing you ought to do is examine your attitude. Examine your attitude. But is my attitude right? Because taking a stand for what's right, I'm standing for God. I don't want to mess up this testimony. I want, to, I want people to know that, that God is love and that Jesus loved them. I want to make sure that they understand that, that when we as believers stand for what is right, we're not standing against them. We are standing against the kingdom of darkness. And we know that. I don't hate you, brother. Especially if, if, if another believer who might uh, be in opposition, that, that they haven't had the eyes of their understanding open yet. So that's just like you getting upset with a child. You, so you see, you see uh, uh, an eight-year-old, and, and he's having trouble trying to open up his candy. And, 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 and well, you should know that by now. No, you help him. And sometimes that means that it's inconvenient or it's uncomfortable. But you help them. You don't marginalize them. You don't push them away. You don't tell them that, oh, you, you, you're not my son anymore. What? You're not my brother anymore. You can't ride your bike. Help him. And sometimes the person that you're trying to help, they, it, it, it's, it's just like your baby. You mothers know. You try to feed the baby, and half of it gets back on you. Right? But in your mind, you're thinking, well, I got something in him. We got to be that patient with each other. And we have to be that patient with unbelievers. Unbelievers do what unbelievers do. They don't believe. So you might be saying, wait, pastor, aren't we supposed to defend the gospel in our Christian values? Absolutely. But it is your attitude. Everybody say attitude. 
Say it again. It's your attitude. Because inherent in every strength is its own weakness. Plastic bottles, strong, durable. That's the strength. But inherent in that strength is the weakness that because they're durable and they last forever, they destroy our environment. While we are steadfast and defending the gospel, we must be careful that we are not stuck in legalism and religious practices and values that separate us from the people that we're trying to reach. We must be careful that we're not stubborn for stubborn sake. You ever run into somebody like that? Just stubborn for stubborn sake? They just want to fight everything. And you want to ask them, well, who hurt you? We must be careful that we're not rigid and unfeeling. That we, that we get so hard and, 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 and unfeeling and, and, and focused on being right that we become self-righteous. We write this down, where there is no love, our strengths can become weaknesses. Where there is no love, our strengths can become weaknesses. So the Bible says, be wise. In the way you act toward outsiders, make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And then 2 Timothy says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach and not resentful. And finally, Proverbs says this, An offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. We write this down, stubbornness will cut you off from God and others. I'm going to ask if you would set everything aside as our worship team comes and we begin to consider the words that we just heard. While we're talking about love, we're talking about the condition of our hearts. We see what our actions look like in the absence of love. In the absence of love, firm looks like a mean-spirited person. It looks like an ugly man or woman. And, 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 and your message is not, is not heard. People can't hear you because they see you. I'm going to ask if you would bow your heads all over the church. Well, every head is bowed and every eye is closed. If you're here, you've never said yes to Jesus. And maybe you have been outside or felt like you've been outside the love of God. I want you to know that his testimony is sure. He said that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And let me tell you, there is nothing that can shorten the reach of God. If you want to be saved from your sin, if you want to be saved from a life of wandering and from a life of wondering, Tonight, the Lord offers you the chance to say yes to him. If you're here and you've never said yes, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, or even online, if you're live streaming and you, 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 you've just been troubled in your heart, right where you are, you don't have to be here, you can say yes to Jesus. So I'm going to ask if you would just raise your hand, and that's 
how we're going to acknowledge that. You're saying yes to the Lord. I'm going to be your witness that you're saying yes to him tonight. I'm, I'm, Pastor, I'm inviting the Lord. I see your hand, sweetheart. Tell mom, I'm inviting Jesus into my heart. Is there another that wants to say yes to Jesus? I see you all the way in the back, back there. Is there another that wants to say yes? Or maybe right where you are, you've just been troubled, and, and you've, these last few years have been really hard for you, and you want to say yes. You want to rededicate your life to Jesus. If that's you, you can raise your hand. I see your hand, sweetheart. That's a great thing you're doing. I see your hearts. And I'm asking if you would just say this prayer with me, Lord. Please forgive me. I thank you for dying on the cross. And I accept your sacrifice. And I pray right now that you would come into my heart and be my Savior. I welcome you and I welcome your love. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.